Hello, and welcome back to Honor of Kings, season number three. This is Hanging Out His Words. This year, we are, or sorry, this season, we are hosting this show on my channel, Hanging Out His Words, and I am the host of this channel, Ken Heidebrecht. Thanks for coming back again, and as always, I have my brother and just amazing person in Christ, who is my friend, Sean Griffin. What's up, Ken? I'm glad to be back again this week. It's so much fun, man. We got to keep digging into these differences between uh, the Septuagint version of Job and the Masoretic version of Job. So there's like, we actually had to condense just to put parts one and part two. We could have did like part three and part four because there's so many, but <laughs> here we are in part two trying to finish up. That's right. And normally we don't actually do this here at Honor of Kings. Typically what we do is we go through some books that have been removed over time, extra biblical books. Sometimes they're called or apocryphal, pseudepigraphal. However, you know, they can be named and we've studied them. We've researched where they came from and why they were removed. If they were in certain canons, uh, tested them to the scriptures of 66 in our Protestant Western canon and determined whether or not they should have been removed or not based off of the context of the overarching themes in the scriptures. And, you know, we've, we've given a thumbs up or a thumbs down depending on the books. And this season we've given a couple thumbs down actually. And, um, I think we might continue doing that in in the future with other books that some people think are legitimate that we're going to test and uh see if it passes the muster or not but so it's been fun sean i really have been enjoying this and i know that people have been edified by it because a lot of times uh i get comments in the comment section saying that they hadn't people have no idea that there were other books in the bible or that there used to be do you ever do you ever get people asking oh, yeah. about that yeah. Yeah. There's different levels of believers, right? Some of them have gotten into the faith and belief and they're the kind like they just they enjoy the music at church. They enjoy the, the, the going to the restaurants afterwards. They never bring their Bible to church and never read their Bible. They only see the verses put on the, the big overhead screen behind the pastor during the service. You know, then there's another group of Christians that actually read the book. And it's it's like a progressive level in your life. If you read the book to where you start to understand like a few important pieces, it, it kind of hooks you to read more of the book and to understand more of the book. But there's a whole swath of believers that do read their Bible, but they've never heard the idea that the current Bible they sell in the stores today and online today in, the United, in mostly the Northern Hemisphere, North America even, have actually less books than in the past. Yeah. And they just they're not aware of that. And so it, it's usually that very small minority of believers that are diligent students of the word, the history of how we got our Bibles, how many different types of Bibles have been here in the past. And that's and that's why, you know, we have a we have a pretty faithful following to the show, I think. Uh, people that actually like to dig in and figure out, you know, why did they take certain books out? Um, why did they not include books in the Catholic canon, but they had them in the Ethiopian canon or the Slavic canon or something like that? So that's why we talk about those types of things to help edify the whole body. But it just depends on their level of understanding to how much of our content will edify them. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I know that it can be a depressing area of study, too, especially if you're someone who is brought up in church being taught and told that the Bible that you have in your hand or in the pew that's it. That's God's word. And that's all he wanted you to know. And so it, it can be disturbing to find out that uh, that's just wasn't the case over the last couple millennia. I mean, it's uh, it's a fascinating area of research, but it can be a little frustrating just knowing that when men get their hands involved and their agendas involved, it can affect a broad scope of people. And it has, unfortunately. So it's it's been an honor to do the show. And I know that um, god willing we're going to continue doing it and uh, hopefully we'll be able to do it on this platform if not another platform in the future that will not suppress us at all or censor us at all and we can get the word out to the masses and uh you know the full scope of the word and with every book that should be included we're, we're hoping right sean yeah that's right that's right all the books that that would be good in fact we actually have a, a sarcastic um fun comment about how we actually have the exact same libraries behind us and it's, this is this is definitely a screenshot that we wanted to use because i actually told kim we should have no books in the library and just have like the bible only or just have like all the books say the bible on it instead of you know commentary of men because that's yeah. the thing that like i've always seen these other uh youtubers that are either pastors or christian commentaries on the bible and they've got these big libraries behind them and it's all these books from men 
And then you hear the words coming out of their mouth and it doesn't match the Bible. And that's the part that kind of irks me. <laughs> exactly. I, I, James, I told Sean a little while ago, I was like, I don't know if we, we should have this nuclear vat of green goo hanging out behind us. It's, yeah, it might look a little better if we have at least something that looks studious, you know, in a way. So <laughs> that's why we changed it up a little bit. But that's funny. So, yes, guys, we are going to be touching on the differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text in the book of Job. This is the second episode, as Sean mentioned earlier. Um, lots of things to cover. But before we get there, Sean, I just want to acknowledge the presence of some of our audience here in the chat. I just want to say hello. Wind Feather, thank you for joining us. Mary Slattery, welcome. Mike Gunder, Sharon Mayoran, thank you for joining us this evening. Sister Marsha, welcome. Mr. Bear, who else we got in here? Arc Builder CCMC, hey brother. Andy, how you doing, buddy? Actually, uh, be on the lookout for uh, a premiere this Tuesday on Hanging on His Words where brother Andy and I from Arc Builders um, are going to be discussing whether or not Yeshua existed literally through the womb of Mary, as in that was his first point of origination, or if he was, you know, the firstborn of all creation from the beginning of time. So we're going to have a, a fruitful discussion uh, that we we went live on air and uh, recorded. So that'll be released on Tuesday. So be be looking out for that. Yeah, go subscribe to his channel, Arc Builder CCMC. Yeah, absolutely. David Shearer, brother, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. James 122. Shannon McKee, Kathy, welcome you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. So, Sean, we got we got quite a bit to to cover here and uh it's a lot of fascinating texts and I think it was a good area where we left our bookmark last time because uh i know yeah. you and i are, are pretty passionate about i mean all all things scripture we're passionate about but we've uh we've made shows specifically on some of the content we're going to be discussing tonight um as it pertains to the day of the lord and some characters that a lot of people don't even realize are, are going to be coming into play in days ahead so i can't wait to, to get to that yeah we don't have to wait let's do it now all right. So do you want to do what we did last time? I'll read the Masoretic text and you read the Septuagint and then we just. Yeah, I think that I think that worked. All right. OK, let's do that. All right. So we got Job 34, 24 to 27 up on the screen. He shall break in pieces mighty men without number and set others in their stead. Therefore, he knows their works and he overturns them in the night so that they are destroyed. He strikes them as wicked men in the open sight of others because they turn back from him and would not consider any of his ways. And the Septuagint, it reads, For the Lord looks down upon all men who comprehends unsearchable things, glorious also, and excellent things work without number, who discovers their works, and will bring night upon them, and they shall be brought low. And he quite destroys the ungodly, for they are seen before him, because they turned aside from the law of God and did not regard his ordinances. Wow. Okay, so we got some pretty glaring differences. In yes. My opinion. Yes, we do. All right. And as we've done in the past, we have it highlighted in the next slide as to what those differences are in the Septuagint. All so right. We so have, the first yeah. bit there, John, for the Lord looks down upon all men who comprehends unsearchable things, glorious also and excellent things without number. So when we compare that to the Masoretic text, I mean, what what a big difference that is from the, you know, the, the first verse of 24 there in the Masoretic text. Yeah, the first the Masoretic uh, verse 24 is almost like a statement of judgment against, you know, mighty men. This other one is is almost uh, kind of expressing a, an admirable character trait of, of Yahweh. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, it's kind of yeah. interesting. But well, so, oh, I mean, ahead. ultimately, I was to say, ultimately, I guess it's it's just giving us a little nugget of info about Yahweh that the first one doesn't. Whereas the first one, the first uh, translation just kind of goes directly into um, what would be verse twenty five and uh, which theme of the judgment, him judging people. Yeah, exactly. Um, because they're not repenting, they're not considering their ways, like verse twenty seven says. But then it's it's actually expounded really really clearly in the Septuagint about how they're not considering their ways and how they've which means their ungodly behavior is defined for us as turning aside from the law of God and not regarding his ordinances. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I mean, so as we talked about in the previous episode, there seems to be this theme of Job and his companions who were also kings. I just want to bring that to the reminder of our audience that these men that are here with Job, they're all kings, including Job himself. And they they had access to the understanding of the law of God. Yeah. And this is in a pre-Mount Sinaitic context. So they had, you know, the terms for righteousness and sin and all that, they would have understood it because they had clearly the law of God. So that's why it makes this, this certain passage really fascinating because, as Sean said, I mean, this is the consequence because they turned aside from the law of God and did not re regard his ordinances. So yeah, you how, know, do you, how do you turn aside from something that you don't have if you're reading the Masoretic text, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, in fact, Ken... Uh, oh, sorry. I guess that doesn't work like that. In fact, Ken, it's interesting that, you know, uh, in case hopefully everyone remembers from... We've said this multiple times on Honor of Kings, but also on part one of this this Job breakdown. The Masoretic text was, was compiled by the descendants, if you will, uh, the disciples, whatever you want to call them, the offshoots of the rabbinic Pharisees. So this was the elders of uh, Judaism that would consider themselves in a Pharisaical fashion during the first century AD. But as the, as the centuries rolled on into the eighth and ninth century AD, they compiled their own canon and their own vert translation of, of uh, from the Greek to a from a Hebrew to the English. And so I think it's interesting that they would take this out because they did teach as a as a sect um, of Judaism. They taught that the law of God was only given at Mount Sinai. And it was only given to Jewish people, to the to Moses and the Israelites there. So for the Septuagint to declare from the perspective of Job and his companions and people around him that they turned aside from people in general who are in, in rebellion, turn from the law of God, don't regard his ordinances. That would be a glaring contradiction to that teaching of Judaism. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. 100 percent. Which I think we saw this last in part one from his friends, right? Because his friends come up talking about you must be in sin. You must need to repent. You know, in the latter, in the earlier chapters of Job. So, yeah. so they're calling Job out for not, we only know there's one definition of sin, and that's you disobeying the law of God. Yeah, First John yeah. 3, 4. Yeah. So for his friends to show up and tell Job, hey, you're in sin, you need to repent. And Job would be like, no, I've been honorable to God and I haven't sinned. Well, they're all going off the definition of whether or not they're obeying the law of God. And none of these people are Israelites. <laughs> right. Right. So it reminds me, Ken, of uh, Jubilees. The book of Jubilees, I think it's mm -hmm. chapter 30, 32 and also Genesis 35, where um, Jacob takes his family and they go to uh, Bethel. So they have, you know, uh, Jacob has Sarah and everyone put away their idols and all the any any of the teraphim that they may have had amongst their camp. And they, they buried them under this oak tree in Genesis 35. And then they travel down to Bethel. And they actually go, they had to wash themselves through baptism. And then they go down to the, to the, to the priest at Bethel. And actually there's like a temple of some sort there where they go to, to worship Yahweh. And then I think this is in Julius 32 as well. And this is also during that trip. This is where we have Levi's given the priesthood um, mm -hmm. through this appointment in his dream. And this is like a big deal, but that means Ken, that during the days of Jacob, which is just a couple hundred years before the days of Job, you would have, there's an active temple that Jacob is not the like he, he goes from what he goes from where he lives to another place where there's already an active temple. And yeah. Jacob has to do the law of God, the ordinance of God for baptism, putting away your idols, cleanse repentance is what we see in Genesis 35 for him and his whole clan, everyone traveling with him. And then they go to this temple that where there's an active priesthood already. Just like when Abraham goes to give tithes and offerings to the Melchizedek, that's an active priesthood already doing the law of God already. Yeah. So I, I think that, yeah, Judaism's teaching kind of flies in the face of that. And they try to glaze over that as I, I debated a rabbi and he just glazed right over that stuff. So, <laughs> yes, they, they do. They glaze over that and they, they they tinker with the words and the phrases a little bit so that it, it becomes a little obscure as to what could be talked about right even in in this book of job where it talks about specific sacrifices and, and priestly duties and stuff they just kind of make it a, a you know a generic thing right and for most people myself included like you just you just read over it right and and it's really crazy to think that a sect a religious sect like judaism would go out of their way to 
to make it seem like God only favored Israel at Sinai and the, the everything before that was just what God was just he just created Adam and said go do your own thing and I'm going to care about giving you an instruction manual like hundreds and thousands of years into into the timeline it just it it really doesn't make sense especially when as you said you start to see some characters like Melchizedek Jacob Abraham Levi, you know, the book of Jubilees, the testament of Levi, and in the testaments of the 12 patriarchs talking about active priesthoods, um, mm -hmm. which is part of the law. And I mean, you can't, you can't not see it when you read that you have to say, okay, there's obviously some sort of a conspiracy going on um, in the minds of these, these individuals who want to seem superior to, you know, all other races of men essentially by claiming that God gave them the law right. and only they can interpret it and only they can tell you what it reads and which books should be in it and all this other stuff. And it's just, you know, it's a thread that you can pull as soon as you start seeing little things in, in the books that they themselves has translated and haven't fully rid themselves of some of the little nuggets that you can stumble upon that, you know, do away with their arguments. Yeah. It reminds me of what we had read from, uh, origin when he talked about the elders of of Israel, the elders of Judaism, and how yeah. they were intentionally hiding their shortcomings, their downfalls. We we discussed this when we when we reviewed Susanna, uh, the book of Susanna. So um, I, it's fascinating because you still see that happening today. If you you know, to me, Judaism is like the the uh, Hebrew version of Mormonism. They take stuff that's in the book, they make up their own stuff. They teach new commandments and new traditions that are not in the scriptures, and they and they have their own alternate version of history that's inconsistent with the Old Testament. Yeah. So it's like Mormonism is just the 17th century or 18th century version of Judaism from a North American perspective, a North yeah. American quote unquote Gentile perspective. You know, it's a good way of putting it. Yeah. You know, and I just I really struggle like how much the modern mainstream Christian church gives credence to quote unquote, the Jews of Judaism, not inspecting the actual belief system of Judaism yeah. to realize, wait a minute, this doesn't line up the Bible at all. They're teaching commandments of men. These are literally the behaviors and practices Yeshua is reprimanding in the gospels. Maybe we should reevaluate how much credence and how many, how many times we quote them in our sermons and how many times we, you know, we reference them. And yeah, yeah. to me, it's, it's rough. They've been cunning and tactful, my friend, but this is why we need to do what we're doing in these latter days is just, you know, exposing the agenda and exposing the uh, the conspiracies, I guess, just so people can get a better handle on the scriptures and come to a full knowledge of God's word without the, you know, the obstruction that is Judaism in their way. So we should yeah. continue on, though, Sean. We got several more passages to cover here. All right. Job 36, 2 and 5. Okay. Suffer me a little, and I will show you that I have yet to speak on God's behalf. I will fetch my knowledge from afar and will ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly, my words shall not be false. He that is perfect in knowledge is with you. Behold, God is mighty and despises not any. He is mighty in strength and wisdom. Okay, the Septuagint says, wait for wait for me yet a little while. I apologize if there's a typo there. Uh, <laughs> that I may teach you, for there is yet speech in me. Having fetched my knowledge from afar and according to my works, I will speak just things truly. And you shall not unjustly receive unjust words. But know that the Lord will not cast off an innocent man, being mighty in strength of wisdom. That's interesting. Okay, so we have some interesting uh, differences here. Yeah. It's actually the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of... It's worded, I mean, it, it's hard to pick every little thing apart in this, but it's... Um, what's he saying here? And truly thou shalt... So I, I think the whole, but know that the Lord will not cast off an innocent man, right? Right. right. God, yeah. And then in the Masoretic, God is, behold, God is mighty and despises not any. He is mighty. Right. I mean, he, I mean, there's a difference there, right? Of, of an innocent man, of course. Like, I agree. Like, the Lord will not cast off an innocent man because an innocent man is likely, you know, doing the whole righteousness thing. As, right, as exactly. Job is claiming to be. In this, there's a definition uh, for that word innocent. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah, well, that's some of the earlier. Nothing in the earlier parts that you want to go over there. I know it's a little. 
Uh, it's the way it's just completely worded different. He says, uh, I will fetch my knowledge from afar. I will ascribe righteousness to, uh, to my maker. Um, the, the Septuagint will say, I fetch my knowledge from afar. And according to my works, I will speak just things truly. Mm -hmm. So he's basically, you know, in the same vein of understanding what the definition of the word righteous is, what the definition of the word innocent is. This guy is saying, according to my works, and this is Job. So, Again, this is going back to the idea that Job knew what right behavior was. Uh, he was actually a priest, um, a priest to Yahweh, and he was this. This is why he could boast about having my works. Right. And it's not like a earning the salvation issue. It's just simply saying I've been doing the right behavior because he knew he had access to read some sort of scroll to tell him what the right behavior was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. and that's imper that's very important to to know is that they had writings, right? Yeah. It's not like like the Joseph Smith thing where they just got a golden tablet that they themselves kind of, you know, yeah. <laughs> created on their own. It, it was stuff that was passed down to them from as far back as at least Enoch. Right. That's right. Yeah. So you didn't see, you didn't see Moses looking into a top hat going, write this down for me as I translate from the golden tablets. Okay. <laughs> what did you say? Yeah. It's pretty silly, man. Yeah. yeah it's a little bit. So we'll go to the next one here, Job 36, 28, and 29. All right, Masoretic text says, which the clouds do drop and distill upon man abundantly. Also, can any understand the spreading of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacle? Hmm. All right, the Septuagint says, the ancient heavens shall flow, the clouds overshadow innumerable mortals. He has fixed a time to cattle and they know the order of the rest. Yet by all these things, your understanding is not astonished. Neither is your mind disturbed in your body. And though one should understand the outspreading of the clouds or the measure of his tabernacle. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a little more detail there. A little more description with the, uh, the creation model. Yeah. So this is Elia. I, if I'm remembering correctly, this is Elihu. Eliahu. I can't mm -hmm. see his name right. Unfortunately. E Elihu. Speaking, this is who's talking, right? Yeah. Okay. I believe so. Job 36. So he had a, a good understanding of the, uh, you know, some of the creation details, at least. I wonder where he would have gotten that from. Right. Well, yeah. So what do we got here, Sean? Highlighted. So we got the whole thing, basically. It, there's more okay. inserted. There's more words and actual text inserted. Yeah. Um, and then you have what it actually says is very different. Yeah. The first um, line stands out to me. Is it to you? Yes, it does. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it's quite a bit different than the Masoretic text. We have the ancient heavens shall flow. And as Sean and I have hopefully just made emphasis on in our channels that the heavens is the name for the firmament. Yeah. And yeah. that's, that's Genesis one, six to eight, right? We get that, that declared to us from the beginning in Genesis. That's right. So we have these, the ancient heavens or firmaments shall flow and the clouds shall overshadow innumerable mortals. So we, we have structures being mentioned that's um, right. as opposed to nothing in the Masoretic text we just have clouds that drop and distill upon men um what else we have here i was trying to pull up one of your um just trying to pull this up uh real quick so just in a, a picture oh, okay. of the ancient heavens yeah that would be this Mr. is taken west off of, blaze well it's actually you and west blaze yeah, this yeah, is yeah. this is your artwork as a base foundation he added some yeah. some text in boxes but but yeah, that's a, the ancient heavens will flow. So if the, if according to the second heaven that actually holds the water, so what do you think it means by the ancient heavens will flow? They must have water. Um, I assume that there's more water than just what's above our heads, but um, probably so. Yeah. Well, we know flowing. Enoch saw. there's river. Yeah, exactly. There's rivers. There's you know, there's waters that are flowing because there are mountains and trees and other land masses and everything just above us. So, I mean, it just yeah. you enough know, for it to say the ancient heavens shall flow. I mean, yep. that, that would make sense, especially when you're looking on screen here and we got other layers above us, other floors above us that have river systems and, and seas and everything else that that are flowing. <laughs> you, you, I also makes me wonder if it possibly is talking about the Revelation 21, 1 through 3, where it says, and I saw the new heavens, new earth, and there was no more sea because mm -hmm. the... New Jerusalem was descending down. So it seems like, you know, the 
I mean, from my understanding of of the idea of from testimony testimony of Levi chapter three verse uh, three through five and Revelation twenty one one through three, it seems like the sea that poured down on the flood from Genesis seven eleven is actually partially drained at the flood, and at the second coming when the New Jerusalem descends, it's going to actually be fully drained away, so that there's a refashioned first and first heaven that yeah. we see. So it'd be very different. So it makes me wonder if there's no more water up there, then what we would be able to see when we look up <laughs> well yeah i know it's I've, I've wondered about how if there's the waters are still above as the psalmist talks about and um uh was it the the prayer of azariah also mentions that there's still waters above the heavens right and this is in a post post flood context um where are these waters going if if the heavens are rolling back like a scroll to right. accommodate yeshua and his myriads of holy warrior angels coming down with him, as well as a massive 1500 mile squared land structure called the kingdom of God. Um, where's the water going? Is it falling down? Like in the days of, you know, the deluge, I don't think doesn't, there's no, yeah, we, we know there's to that. Right. And we're, and he's not going to flood the earth again. So right. there, there's clearly, I would suggest they're being drained into some other cavity or some yeah, other part of the outside firmament. of the firmament, right? Exactly. Yeah. Outside of it somewhere outside of the, the enclosed area where we live for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be in one of these other levels that are around us, Yeah, you know, to contain it. So that'd be interesting. Um, but yeah, well, that would just be crazy because then it wouldn't be darkness when you, it wouldn't be a dark pool of water above us when you look up above. Uh, you, I, I imagine the sun, that could be why it talks about the sun shining brighter. If there's that barrier of water that's missing between us and the sun at that point. Um, Nick, yeah, I'm just speculating here. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's cool to think about. It would actually be really neat to make a visual representation of the return of Messiah while all this stuff is happening, right? Just Yeah. That'd be really cool to do. Hopefully one day we can get to that, something like that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, in, in the same regards of him mentioning the ancient heavens, which is above us, um, he also mentions this unique concept about the cattle knowing their rest. Um, I think that's interesting to me because it's like, you, you've ever heard of how you know they've documented the beavers rest on Sabbath? Yeah, yeah I have, yeah. So it, does do cattle do that too? We just haven't noticed. But what are, do cattle even work? Like, what do cattle do that we consider work? You know? Yeah, it'd be interesting know. to to analyze that one day. Just look at all of them. <laughs> but it's Sean. So the last part here, or the measure. So and though one should understand the outspreading of the clouds, or the measure of his tabernacle, yeah, that's, that is that's huge. different than or the noise of his tabernacle, right? That's in the Masoretic right. text. So. Yeah, that's huge because that's to me that is Jubilees 32, 32. Yeah, where Jacob gets this the tablets of heaven, he has an angelic vision, and he wants to build the tabernacle of God. And the angel has to tell him, No, stop. You're not the dude to build it, and you're not going to build it here. So <laughs> yeah. so if that was a couple hundred years before the days of Job, and Jacob was still living in the land of you know Hebron and and that whole area of, of Bethel and that whole concept. Is it possible they had, you know, that word spread and teachings spread to people that kept that were being discipled in the ways of Yahweh to the point where now Job even has that kind of information? Yeah, I mean, to, it's, or and Elihu to plausible. be referencing this kind of stuff. Very plausible. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah you, have to, you have to think like, where is he getting this information from? Yeah, right? I mean, he's not just conjuring it up in his in his uh, discourse here with Job. He has some knowledge from yep. somewhere <laughs> that's right yeah. yeah yeah in fact at the beginning of his introduction i'm pretty sure he brags about his knowledge yeah so it's pretty funny but yeah kim we'll we'll run to um a commercial real quick and we'll come back and we'll finish these up sounds good
All right. Where were we? I think we our next one is Job 38, 4 and 7. Okay. So I'll read the Masoretic text. It says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So now this is Yahweh speaking, guys. Where were you? Obviously. <laughs> where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if you have understanding. Who has laid the measures thereof, if you know? Or who has stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning starts sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? The Septuagint reads, Where were you when I founded the earth? Tell me now if you have, an, if you have knowledge. Who set the measures of it, if you know? Or who stretched a line upon it? Or what are its rings fastened? And who is he that laid the cornerstone upon it? When the stars were made, all my angels praised me with a loud voice. Okay. Hey. Very interesting. Okay, so it, it sounds very similar, and it I just want to—I just want to uh, point out that you know I know we have here highlighted all my angels praise me with a loud voice, whereas the Masoretic text is all the sons of God showed it for joy. That's very similar because it's, the sons of God is a reference used for the angelic brethren above, right, Sean? It is, but that's in my opinion that's the the conclusion of people that are being honest with the text. <laughs> Unfortunately, Ken, there's a lot of people, even in major seminaries, specifically in the Baptist Theological Seminary, that refuse to acknowledge that the use of the term sons of God, which in the Hebrew is Benah Elohim, they refuse to acknowledge that that's refer referring to angels. Mm -hmm. And they actually will try to convince their, their seminary students that um, the references in Job 1 and 2, also here in Job 38, as well as in Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, they try to tell them that those are just men being referenced as sons of God. Yeah. So no, well, this, the ancient Greek translators who were Hebrew, by the way, the people, the ancient Greek Hebrew men who spoke Hebrew and Greek and translated the Hebrew into Greek in approximately the third century BC, they knew the difference and they call them angels in the Septuagint. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no ambiguity here with yeah. the Septuagint version. Um, you know, which is, which is interesting because, as I note in one of my videos on, I think it's the firmaments of heaven um, and creation days one and one to three, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, you know, we don't know when the angels are created, right? We're not right. told. This is, this is an interesting little tidbit of information to have because here it says when the stars were made, all my angels praised me with a loud voice. So that, that indicates that the angels were at least created before the stars, whereas Jubilees, it just flat out tells us, right? Yeah. Day number yeah. one. Yep. all the spirits all the angels and it lists all the classifications so very very interesting stuff brother so um oh you, you meant to say jubilees two one two yeah two one and two yeah that it basically tells you the angels are created on day one what did i say job Ju you just said jubilees one so if if i just sorry oh, okay. slight, slight correction i thought i said jubilees two okay no thank sorry. you sorry or maybe i misheard you my but my bad but either way i just hopefully the listener is clear if you yeah. you know it's not in the masoretic text i know we've we covered Jubilees 1 and 2 in Season 2, but we didn't make it much further past that. We're going to get back to Jubilees in the future, but um, there, we, as you can hear us already reference, and you can probably tell our opinion on Jubilees. So <laughs> it's just got so much in there that is literally easily verified with the, with the Masoretic. And in this case, it, it's just another validation of Jubilees even to, to help us understand why Job would be making this claim or why God's making this claim in Job 38. Right, right, right. Absolutely. So, yeah. Sean, on what are its rings fastened exactly? Yeah, this is fascinating, right? Because I just imagine like this massive uh, pre-made world, you know, in Genesis 1, you know, like um, where he's going to lay the foundations down on day one before day two even. So it's just like these massive rings that come down because you remember he looks upon the circle of the earth. So it's like if the earth itself was fashioned inside the foundations and if they're in a circular fashion, and they're like laid down where these these ferment layers are being dropped. Yeah. Then that would be the ring, in my opinion. Yeah, exactly. I, I actually made a little. Uh, Let me put this back on screen. Dish. Yeah, <laughs> put that back up. <laughs> so the rings, as you guys can see on screen, there we've got. I mean, they're displayed in color because it's supposed to, you know, parallel the rainbow. In, in our opinion, we we think that the uh, the seven colors of the rainbow is just kind of giving us a little hint at how many ferment layers there are, but so what sean is saying essentially is you see where the bottom of the each firmament in the the rainbow structure you see there hits the pillars of heaven that's kind of like where the i guess the rings of each yeah. uh firmament would would lay on the foundation right and so, and i just want to put this out here this is just what my mind came up with 
when reading all the text regarding biblical cosmology, the rings could literally be like a ring, right? Like a circular flat but, like, ring that's built like, on top. So I don't. Sorry, yeah. Or, or even like an up, upside down bowl. Who's the, the, uh, the lip of the bowl is like a big ring. You yeah. Know? So there's, there's a wide variety of ways is, to look at it. But. This is a, what do they call it? Uh, like a sagittal frontal sagittal, uh, splicing of view here. Right. So it's if, just if a you're, side if, profile. Right. So if, you know, as Sean said, if you, you, you know, if you were to see this whole thing in like a 360 degree fashion, you would see it would be like a, like bowls essentially. Right. Yeah. The Lord sits above the circle of the earth. So therefore the, the, the ferments are circular. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, hopefully that's a decent visual for folks. Yeah. But uh, that's a fascinating little passage there. And Job 38, 24. By what way is the light parted, which scatters the east wind upon the earth? The Septuagint says, from which place proceeds the frost, or from which place is the south wind dispersed over the whole world under heaven? <laughs> so that's that's yeah, quite it's, different. Yeah, it's quite it's, different. It's referring to what we were just talking about, essentially, the structure mm -hmm. itself. Like, right? where are these things coming from? Which place? Yep. And this knowledge, by the way, the answers to this particular question is in the book of Enoch, where he talks about the, the 12 different gates from the east, the west, the north, and the south, and they blow different things. And one of them, I think it's from the north, it blows the frost. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't yeah. remember what chapter that is in the Enoch. It's like Enoch 82 or something. Yeah. And in Enoch, it also talks about how there is an angel over the frost, over that's the right. snow. The same thing with Jubilees 2, too. Yep. Yeah. That's yeah, right. yeah. So it's crazy. We, I mean... We got to get a hold of these books, you guys. That it gives you so much more information on on these other entities that were created on day one. Yeah, and of course, there's also another lovely mention of the whole world under heaven, which I think is just fascinating. But that's the biblical cosmolog cosmologist in me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Job forty nineteen. It says he is the chief of the ways of God. He that made him can make his sword to approach unto him. The Septuagint says, this is the chief of the creation of the Lord, made to be played with by his angels. All right, so we need a little context here, Sean, for the viewer. We do. The, uh, the individual being spoken of, or the creature, rather, being spoken of here is in reference to Leviathan. That's right. And um, I just want to point out that uh, I was watching something on Facebook. Well, actually real today. quick, Ken, Ken I think this, is, this particular one, I think he's talking about... Um, He's talking about was oh, this behemoth behemoth yeah oh, okay sorry yeah this yeah. is behemoth you're right yeah okay so never mind yes this i was going to talk about leviathan a little bit there but this is behemoth right yeah this is behemoth leviathan yeah, Job, is in chapter 41 right okay. Job 40 and he talks about behold behemoth right 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 okay so just didn't want to confuse myself so him being the chief of the ways of god um that first is the this is the chief of the creation of the Lord. I mean, we mm -hmm. we believe that this was the first kind of like beast that was created, right? Yeah, and that's what actually Second Ezra 6 talks about, is that on day five, whenever all the other animals were made, mm -hmm. um, this the, the Leviath, excuse me, Leviathan behemoth were made on that day five as well. Yeah. And so that would make sense, whereas all the, the water creatures were made on day three, right? Uh, yes. The plant, plants of the earth and the water creatures were made on day three. No, that's not right. No, because day, day four was the sun, moon, and stars. Day five was, I think, all the things that team in the earth and all the things that team on the land. Is that right? Let me go back to it. Real quick. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you Gen better just pull Genesis. that up. It's been a while since I've. It's I've Genesis one thing. here. All right, so day five. Yeah. While you're pulling that up, I just want to make mention the uh, this concept of meant to be played with by his angels. Mm -hmm. it's not it's not like the angels are gonna get like are or are playing with behemoth like they're petting him or something like he's a giant dog for them or something right but the the word there actually it is translated differently in other versions of the septuagint as sported with that's right when you when you're sporting with something you're not petting it you're actually trying to kill it that's so. right it's weird how that word play in English it has several different meanings in other languages because same thing within an Exodus 32 as it talks about the people worshiping Baal. They rose up to play after they ate the sacrificial meal to Baal. But if you look in the Hebrew, that word and also in the Greek, it shows you that they didn't rise up to just play like children, but to do like inappropriate sexual stuff. Yeah. So yeah. in the same in the same regard, the use of this concept with the angels sporting with behemoth, it's not just like a pet. They're going to kill him. 
-hmm. because that's the, you know, that's what we're going to read about. But that's also the idea of second is Ezra chapter six says they're made on day five. And here is all the things, um, moving creatures that has life, fowl that fly above the earth, the open firm of the heaven, the great wells, every living creature that moves, the waters that brought forth the money after their kind, every winged fowl, uh, God blessed them, multiplied them. So um, this is day five. And supposedly this was when Leviathan and Behemoth were both made. That's right. So, so I'm guessing before even all these other things were made, the Behemoth was made as the chief of the creation of the Lord, which which the word in the Hebrew uh, and in the Greek for chief, that means uh, it's Rosh in Hebrew, and it means um, first or head or chief. Yes, exactly. And yeah. we see that actually iterated in second Ezra, second Baruch, um, Enoch, as well as, as these creatures being made and for a specific reason which we're going to get to uh but yeah as as god's first creation of of creatures so that's right very interesting that's right and we got a comment here hannibal saying if behemoth is anything close to godzilla size brain exploded. will be blown yeah yeah well, and to me that's why they have those movies that's why they have that lore that mythology i was just gonna say that's that's why your mind went to godzilla because that's it's, right you know these people making these movies uh they know they know yep. what the scriptures have taught about and what's supposed to be coming in day yeah. ahead. Yeah, and this is why the angels have to kill them. I mean, they were literally created uh, to be food, as we've we've talked about this before. I don't think I'm spoiling mm -hmm. anything, am I? I mean, no, we've, no, no. We've done asking. entire episodes on this in, in season two, but yeah. uh, they were created to be food. So, uh, to me, it's like when they do show up, yeah, they're going to cause some massive massive carnage and havoc, and they have to be stopped. And mankind can't stop them; only the angels can stop them. Yeah. So that's something to think about, right? Very like, crazy. Just like in these movies, they have these these huge creatures. They call them titans in the movies, which I think is very interesting. And then they have these creatures fighting each other and, and causing havoc on the earth. And like the militaries of the earth can't really stop them. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they make one of the big creatures to be the good guy that fights off the other bad big creatures so that somebody they can stop the fighting. Otherwise, yeah. But that's that's the twist of the actual truth. The truth is. Father made these two massive creatures for a specific purpose to be food for the survivors of the day of the Lord. And that's, that's crazy. I just, I know we talked about it last season, brother. I just still, it still blows my mind to the point of like making my heart skip a beat to think of just how much he loves us to the point where on day five, before anything happened, Isaiah 42, 10, right? He's, he's the, the Lord who knows the end from the beginning. Yeah. And before anything happened, this guy, the father is saying, I'm, I got to make these two massive beasts because by the volume of their size, I'm going to be able to feed all the millions of survivors of the day of the Lord who come to my new Jerusalem and need provision. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have my angels go out and kill these guys. Yeah. And, and you know what, Sean, what's more significant to me now in the days that we live in, um, especially with the whole Davos agenda 2030 and them pretty much telling you that you're not going to be eating much meat in days ahead. That's They're going to make it, right. you're going to be eating synthetic versions of meat. So right. I'm just wondering, I mean, in the father's providence, knowing the end from the beginning, like how bad it is going to be in those 42 months when the Apollo, Apollyon rather shows up, what's the world going to be like? Are people not going to be eating any meat anymore? Is this the reason why father has to bring a massive amount of meat to the people because they're so famished they're, they're so they're just not eating real food at that juncture of time like it's just it, it's crazy to think about they're eating these uh gelatin uh health energy bars made of insects <laughs> yeah. yeah that's crazy man just like on snow piercer all right so we'll go back to this and let me see here we had one more uh job 40 24 okay so Maseret text says he takes it with his eyes, his nose pierces through snares. The Septuagint says, yet one shall take him in his sight. One shall catch him with a cord and pierce his nose. All right. So much clearer in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, you got some, someone or an entity, a powerful one catching him with a cord. So I just, when I read this, man, I'm just thinking of like this, this super strong angel or like a company of angels kind of just doing like a lasso onto like, you know, this creature's nose and snagging it with something and just pulling it down type thing. And, you know, and just slaying it. Whereas in the Masoretic text, it's just, he takes it with his eyes, his nose pierces through snares. Like that doesn't, 
that doesn't really describe really what's going on in, in the context of of this creature right yeah um yeah it's it's very just und- indescriptive in the masoretic but the idea of actually catching with the cord and piercing his nose it's very descriptive in my opinion especially since it, it consistently with the septuagint previously um where it says the angels will be the one that actually kills it right so that yeah. that would make more sense of the one and we even talked about in season one of Arnold kings this uh apocalypse of abraham that mentions the angel joel yeah. who su- supposedly has the the keys to let this these animals loose or at least leviathan which also makes me wonder is he also a part of the crew the crew of angels that kill him possibly right i mean it's it's interesting as you said the apocalypse of abraham mentions this angel as being the one that restrains the leviathan yeah um you know what do you do with that information that's that's interesting yeah it is Um, in fact you know what it reminds me of um there is let me pull this up real quick if I can. There is a uh, a unique moment here. If I can find it for the viewer, I won't play the sound. But there's a unique moment of an of well, imagine instead of the Hulk, it's an angel taking down the Leviathan by his nose, right? Yeah, because he's gonna punch this thing right in the nose, right in the snout, and bring down this massive Leviathan that's in this movie Avengers. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. So I don't know. I doubt they did that on purpose, but I think it's, it's to give the the audience kind of a visual of why they would take it and pierce its nose to bring it down. Yeah. And it's going to be much bigger than that thing. I think so. Yeah, I think so. so. I mean, it's crazy to think about even this in the apocalypse of Abraham. I know we're not in that book right now, but since we're talking about it, we're, um, it, it, you know, Abraham saw the monster Leviathan in his dominion, um, in the caves in the world which lay above him, his movements and the destruction of the world on his account. That's, That's what right. it says. Yeah. Right? So, like, this thing is massive. It's below us. And I can't help but think of <laughs> the, uh, what was it? I can't remember which flat earth guy it was. Y- you know the story, right? Where, where Buddy mm-hmm. was out there kind of doing some street preaching, talking yeah. to people about biblical cosmology, and he ends up just randomly meeting up with Elon Musk's nephew, Jack Musk. Yep. And he tells yes. this guy essentially that him and the Musk family have always learned or known that we live on a giant mountain that's on the back of a Leviathan. Yeah, it's crazy. Crazy statement to just say from some college kid in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's wild. <laughs> especially, especially because he wasn't asked about it. That's yeah. that's the thing. Like they were talking about, you know, the biblical cosmology that we don't live in a ball of space that we live under, you know, a domed concept that with a, you know, circle of Earth. But as that topic came up, no one mentioned Leviathan or Behemoth. But yet mm-hmm. this Jack Musk kid just offered this information about what his family taught him growing up. Yeah. And they, they snuffed it off, eh? The guys that were in, that were talking yeah. to him, they were like, they, we don't know what he's talking about with that. It's probably some whatever. Yeah. But I'm like, the, when you told me that, because you, you were the one that told me about that little snippet on, on that video, and I was just like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Because we at that yeah. time, we were we were going, you know, we were doing our presentations on the Bioth and Behemoth and, and their return. <laughs> so. Yeah, I wonder if... Um, uh, was, it, if was it Nathan Roberts that, that did that yeah. one? Yeah. yeah, it was. Yeah, I, I didn't. Of course, YouTube is blocking his channels, so I can't pull it up quickly anymore. Yeah, but um, I wonder. Love if to get a hold of that snippet. Find that again in the future, but um, so yeah, I'll, I'll get back to the next one here. Sure, yeah. Joe forty one six and seven. Okay, so now we're talking about Leviathan here. Shall the com- shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with barbed irons or his head with fish spears? The Septuagint reads, and do the nations feed upon him and the nations of the Phoenicians share him and all the ships come together would not be able to bear the mere skin of his tail. Neither shall they carry his head in fishing vessels. <laughs> Crazy. All right, so just in case the, the audience is not aware, the Phoenicians, uh, that's the city of Tyre, extremely uh, seafaring peoples, uh, merchants of the sea all over the world. And uh, yeah, they would probably have... St- by volume of ships, they would probably be one of the nations with the most ships because that's all they did was sea trade. So this is trying to give us the comparison that, you know, the nations feed upon him, which is what was promised at the coming of the day of the Lord. So this is 
the father expressing his plan that we saw from uh, Second Ezra six, and where is it? Also in the pocket was some Baruch. Uh, yeah, Second uh, Baruch. Second twenty nine. Twenty nine, and then also in Enoch chapter sixty, mm -hmm. uh, they're mentioned as well. Be food for the nations. So, it, like the father is in Job validating this plan that he has for these two creatures, and he's trying to express that even the nations of the Phoenicians, which was a co uh, an empire like nation entire that interacted with all the other nations and had them under them as princes for their ships to go out and ex expedite their trade and increase their reach. So he's just trying to give the a modern day comparison of this yeah. massive uh, naval force of the Phoenicians empire. Not all, not all of them even could, could bear the mere skin of just his tail. Yeah. The scale is very alarming. Yeah. That's freaky. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's insane. But uh, it's Troy Sean. I wanted to uh, make mention that. Um, so here in both Masaryk text and the Septuagint, it, it paints Leviathan out to be a male, mm -hmm. right? It says, uh, you know, shall they part him among the merchants or, you know, will mm -hmm. do the nations feed upon him? Um, there, the translators are actually just assuming the gender here. Mm -hmm. There are other Septuagint versions like the Lexham uh, English Septuagint and the Alexam English Bible, which I think is a, a pretty good version of scriptures as well. They they put it as its. So, ah. so it would be like, shall the companion make a banquet of it? Shall they part it among the merchants? They they don't just assume, assume gender because we know that in the book of Enoch, it actually straight out tells us that Leviathan is a female. But he and that's interesting. Male. What little I do know about the Greek language is that the pronouns for he, she, and it are the same word, and it depends on the translator's, you know, right. opinion or understanding to which one he uses. So right. that would make sense. That would make sense. Yeah, and if you just go to like a Bible Hub and pull up Job forty one six, or six and seven or whatever, I mean, you'll have a, a array of different translations, obviously, but the majority of them do put it as him, but several of them do say it. Okay. So, yeah. Which leaves yep. room for Enoch to be correct, in my opinion, with with Leviathan being a female. Because I've had that I've had that come up before in the past when I released my videos on it. They're like, well, you know, what what about you know these texts saying that Leviathan is a him, a he, a male? And I just had to tell them straight up, this is what other versions are saying. And as you yeah. said, like the the ancient languages don't they just assume it? The translators assume the gender mm -hmm. based off of their bias um, or lack of understanding what these creatures really are and and what other texts say about them so right if you're the dude that's commissioned to go translate job uh and then you don't realize that you haven't read enoch because that text isn't available to you well then you might assume it's a he that might be an easy reference for you especially right. if you don't even believe it you're not taking it seriously <laughs> yeah. then you wouldn't care to get it right either so it's, it's interesting it's, it's where it gives us the honor of kings to do our due diligence and find out the truth that's right. I don't know. Did R.H. Charles do other scriptures like the canonized 66? I don't know if he did or not. Um, but if he did, I'd be interested to see his his rendition of um, the gender in the book of Job regarding Leviathan. I, I bet you he would have put she. Yeah. Well, he translated Enoch as yeah. one of the translators. So yeah. interesting. And okay. he was a Greek. He was a Greek scholar. He was a Greek professor. So mm -hmm. uh, Job 41, 33 and 34. He makes a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is not his like, who is made without fear. He beholds all high things. He is a king over all the children of pride. The Septuagint reads, The lowest part of the deep as a captive. He reckons the deep as his range. There is nothing upon the earth like to him, formed to be sported with by my angels. He beholds every high thing, and he is king of all that are in the waters. Okay. So in this version here, it actually says the whole sported um, aspect mm -hmm. of it. I mean, yes, Leviathan Behemoth gets the same outcome as Leviathan, right? They're going to be sported by the angels, right? But uh, well, I think it's uh, <laughs> it's interesting, and and the more I read this particular per passage here in the Greek, the more it makes me think of of that old um, image uh, of. Let me pull it up real quick. That old image that you see that's like a stereotypical flat earth image um, let me look at real quick yeah i think i know which one you're talking about well it's got it's got the three levels of the firmament and then one of the top levels is this the big serpent flying around mm -hmm. and i can't find of course i can't find it it's not going to pull up because google censors that kind of information now 
But in, um, my, in the image I made, I actually put Leviathan in the cavernous area, kind of below the. I think it was yeah. right near near Sheol. It's too small in that in that picture, but. Well, I have the reason to get to that video in my biblical creation series, it's uh, it's the next one on, on my queue to do. But as Sean just zoomed in there, Leviathan is just below the earth, kind of right above Sheol. Obviously, that's just my rendition of it. Yeah. I just, it. Somewhere in a cavernous area below us, right? It has to be in such a way as the apocalypse of Abraham describes that it the earth shakes when it moves. Right. So it's got to be below us in a way where, you know, <laughs> we can feel its movement. Well, here's my thought, and this is a crazy thought because we're just we're just speculating on speculating, some yeah. of the descriptions. Okay, so with um, both of what uh, Second Baruch twenty nine says, with what the Apocalypse of Abraham says about him, and with what we're reading here, it says the lowest part of the deep as a captive. He reckons the deep as his range. That means where he runs around and where he exists. To some, there's nothing like unto him. There's nothing up on the earth like to him, formed to be sport with with by my angels. We already talked about that. And he beholds everything high. I didn't. I didn't highlight that, but it's just point thinking out to me right now. Like, wait a minute, is it possible? Since we talked about the waters above the heavens as well, and they connect with the waters below the earth and the exterior of the firmament, is it possible that he's enclosed in this layer of firmament in the waters, and he can go above us or he can go below us? Hmm. Just an idea, which could be where the ancient people got that depiction of the big serpent above us in the firmament. Interesting. So that he could go back to his sleeping, his house, if you will, which would be below the earth and the caverns that are spoken about here, which would cause the earthquake when he moves. But he also possibly could go above is how he could behold everything, every high thing. And I don't know. I'm just speculating here. Just speculating. Yeah. I mean, that would be interesting if the waters of the abysses um, were somewhat attached to the waters above the heaven in a way where he can. Right. Or she can <laughs> within uh, the within the it. structure of the firmament that encapsulates us, yeah. you know, that if it was somehow connected and that's how they drained down and leveled out and equaled out in some degree. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah, that's so, interesting. No, and just thought. a thought. Just a yeah. thought. Good thought. All right. So let's go to the next one here. Job 42 8. All right. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, and that you have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. Hmm. The, the Septuagint reads, Now then take seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job. He shall offer a burnt offering for you, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will only accept him. But for his, for but his sake I would have destroyed you, for you have not spoken the truth against my servant Job. Hmm. <laughs> subtle subtle little differences there right yeah, yeah yeah the first one there he shall offer a burnt offering for you wait didn't the other one say that you got to do it yourselves that that puts job in an interesting position right that's right yeah it makes him the priest and the other people in under his authority yeah and how would you have a priest if you're not doing the torah if you're not doing the law of god again goes back to the speculation of why this possibly would be translated so differently by mm -hmm. uh, rabbinic pharisees in the ninth century ad this is this is what perplexes me a little, Sean. Is this like why would they even leave some of that verbiage in there? If you're already <laughs> tinkering with the text, you know what I mean. You're already messing with things, deleting things, inserting things. Why would why would you leave some of it there, like that? When when I read that, I'm thinking this sounds priestly still in the Masoretic text, right? It, it does, burnt but offerings it, like yeah, it, go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. The, the pray for you part, hundred percent would imply that Job is the one that is in a priestly position to pray for people. Yeah. But if people don't know the Torah, they will never, they'll never see that because they don't so know do the function. Of the priest. Okay. So you think they're, they would just assume people's naivety and um, lack of understanding and knowledge of just the word in of itself that they don't need to remove large swaths like that. And they just, yeah. One of the cool things I figured out or that I, I, I stumbled upon, if I could put it like that with that debate with that rabbi was that, they ignored anything to do with the priesthood yeah and they don't teach it in fact uh that's also that i found confirming information from rachel eliar the, the hebrew university right. um dead sea scrolls dead sea scrolls professor and she talked about in the dead sea scrolls it was all about the priesthoods and the importance of that but then in the first century a.d rabbinical pharisees decided to stop talking about the priesthood or the word covenant because 
they didn't want people to understand who Jesus was. That's not her conclusion. I'm just talking about her conclusion from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which she did conclude that, and she's and she's baffled by it because she's a um, you know she's considers herself a Jewish person who lived, who's grown up in Israel and is the professor emeritus of Hebrew philosophy uh, of Hebrew history, specifically concerning the Hebrew text manuscripts, specifically the Dead Sea Scrolls, right. and she's like the head professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And she's questioning in this video I did, uh, given an expose of her of her her speech. She's questioning why did the first century rabbin, uh, rabbis stop talking about the priesthood and stop talking about the covenant, and won't even mention the word covenant in many of their writings. Mm -hmm. It's very suspect considering the history of the Old Testament writings. And she doesn't understand it. I hundred percent understand it because they're trying to hide Yeshua. They don't yeah. want anyone to be able to piece yeah, together the reason why Yeshua was told that he would become our high priest. Yeah. So anything to do with teaching them the, the descriptors of a priest, which would match Yeshua, they would, in my opinion, they would want to either glaze over or just not teach at all. That's what I saw in real life example by talking with that rabbi of Orthodox Judaism. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Highly recommend that video. Um, David, I know you're, you're hard at work in the uh, chat yeah. there. Thank you so much for doing that. That's great. Check that out, brothers and sisters. Very, very well done video that Sean did. Sean, do you want to pull up Sister Marsha's uh, comment there right above? A couple, a couple of comments above that one. <laughs> I wonder if Leviathan tastes like lamb or chicken. And, and then Windfeather said, good point. Um, you know, she said, I know my mind went to what Leviathan would taste like too. Well, we're not going to taste either of these beasts, actually. So no. we just, we want to, we want to clarify that the survivors of the day of the Lord the, the mortals that don't end up getting destroyed by the wrath of the lamb and his angels, they're the ones that are going to partake of this food across the earth. We, however, are going to be resurrected at that juncture and we're going to have a different feast um, of, I, I would assume, lamb. But uh, yeah, we're not, we're not going to be taking part of that. So don't, yeah. don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> But we, as we talked about in our Leviathan episodes in season two of Honor Kings, as we went over, I think it either was Enoch, right? As yeah. we discussed it's, it in Enoch. They're clean. Yeah. They are clean animals. So we, 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 we go through that. Too. Go check that out. Season two, we go over it in depth. So yeah, because we, we want to also clarify that the father would never feed large amounts of people, whether, whatever they believe, doesn't matter. He would not feed them something that's unclean that it goes against his instruction manual for, for yeah. the dietary instructions. So just, just yeah, and I probably should make this clear, Ken. I know as I talked about ancient depictions earlier, and I was referring to the ancient depictions showing Leviathan as a big serpent, uh, and people would immediately go, "But wait, Sean, you know the serpent's not clean." Well, that's their ancient depiction. I don't know if yeah. Leviathan is actually—it's clearly a sea creature, but it is it actually of the reptile class of a serpent of some sort? I I don't think so because of all the research we did in that video we keep referencing. Mm -hmm. So go check that out. Yeah. All right. And this is, we're getting close to the, to the most important part of this entire study. We're almost there again. All right. Job 42, nine Masoretic says, so Eliphaz, the Temanite and Bildad, the Shuhuite and Zophar, the Naamathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. Job 42, nine Septuagint reads. So Eliphaz, the Temanite and Baldad, the Sukite, and so far the Midianite went and did as the Lord commanded them, and he pardoned their sin for the sake of Job. There you go. <laughs> That's very different to me. Yeah, yeah. So like we said earlier, sin is transgression of Yahweh's instruction mm -hmm. manual, his law, First John 3, 4. Um, mm -hmm. He pardoned their sin, their transgressions, for, for the sake of Job, right? I mean, and this, and this because Job was stepping up as the priest to, to do this so that right. they can actually come about for them that's how a priesthood works that's torah that's what yeshua yeah. does for us for the sake of yeshua ministering his priesthood first timothy 2 5 our sins are pardoned that's mm -hmm. the glory of the father's behavior his torah his way for the priesthood and we're seeing exemplified here in honoring job because this whole book job is saying i haven't sinned yeah and then his friends kept saying you're lying you have sinned tell us what your sin is yeah and this is interesting sean because i've always wondered like these men, these kings that were coming up and, and antagonizing him and, and just getting him to confess something that he had not done. Um, you know, do we take their words literal? Can we trust their knowledge and everything that they displayed in the discourses they had with, with Job? 
because of their accusations towards him like you know what i'm getting at like i've, I've seen people say like can we trust their descriptions because a lot of them talk about biblical cosmology and, and etc and it's like if they're not really righteous people and they're trying to like pigeonhole job into this you know confession about something that he did not do like can we trust them yeah this is job's intervention unneeded intervention here yeah yeah, I, I here's the thing though. The, their claims we can find and validate throughout other books and scriptures. So yeah. just because someone may have an accurate understanding of biblical cosmology and actually even theology, but still improperly accuse someone who's innocent of sin, mm -hmm. right? And I can't remember the the proverb right now. I think it's in proverb. Uh, I can't remember the proverb right now, but it talks about that that the Lord does not like you know that when someone condemns the innocent, right? Right. You know, so that's why he was telling him earlier, I would have destroyed you for how you treated Job if it wasn't for Job basically mediating for you. Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. And and these guys, obviously, they knew what the law was. I mean, I I've, based off of my understanding after reading the Septuagint and comparing it to Masoretic text, I, I figured these guys were following God's commands. They just they were faulty men as well. That's right. Um, they, they had a lot of great things to say in, in their dialogue with him. Um that's right. save the the accusations that they were that they were hurling over at uh, they're job. looking they're looking at job and they're saying look we see all these bad things that have happened to you surely you're in sin because these resemble the outcomes of a sinful life you see what i'm saying mm -hmm. and that's where job's like well no i haven't actually you know i haven't sinned and they're like that can't be because all these things would have happened to you if you had been blameless yeah you know what i mean yeah, Proverbs seventeen fifteen, brother. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to Yahweh. So it that sounds I mean. sounds consistent because he said he wanted to destroy them. Right, and and therefore Job had to step up and, and do what his priestly duties, uh, you know, was supposed to do for them in that in that instance. So that's right. Yeah. It was a serious offense in Yahweh's eyes. So. What so what the Septuagint shows us in this passage is that throughout this entire book, Job's strength of character and his actual ability to follow the, the law of God and be considered blameless and righteous is what ironically saves his friends who are falsely accusing him. Yeah. So it's yeah, like it's it's an amazing story mm -hmm. if you have the lens of understanding the law of God. It's That's amazing. Right. Yeah. All right, so Amen. Job forty two nine. Um, um, I sorry, I, I had a typo. I apologize. This should be forty two nine. It's okay. So forty should be forty two ten. Okay. So all right, and I can read it. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. The Septuagint reads, and the Lord prospered Job when he prayed also for his friends. He forgave them their sin. And the Lord gave twice as much, gave Job twice as much, even the double of what he had before. There we go. Okay. Nice. So uh, it's just harping upon his priestly outcome. Yeah, exactly. So it also just tells us that to me, if people didn't really get it, I hope they get it. Job was a, a priest. He's doing a priestly duty. The founder is honoring a priestly duty and specifically giving credit to Job for that. This is his Torah. This is how it works. So when people say, well, how did they create atonement before Jesus showed up? Well, they had a priest. They had a law, not yeah. just on the earth, but also the angels in heaven. We've done shows on that when we reviewed mm -hmm. the Testament of Levi in, in season two. Yeah. So the yeah, father was, has all these backups. It, exactly. Yeah, it is backup. Yeah. That was mind blowing, man. When we came across the the uh, details about the angels doing priestly duties above and we're just mirroring everything that's going on up there. It's, that's right. This is yeah. why Hebrews 1 tells us that Yeshua's priesthood was given him an authority, which is called a name in the Greek, a name above all names, a name even above the angels, as it says in Hebrews 1, 5, because the angels have a name, quote, a priesthood, a yeah. authority, which they're already doing in heaven over mankind. And that's expressed in books that have literally been taken out of the scriptures of our accessibility. So we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be having to learn about this at this point in history. If we'd had all the original books, the Israelites were reading from in the first century AD, if we had them in our, our access in, in the 20th, 21st century AD, it, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have so much questions, you know? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So, all right. We're almost done here. Got a couple more slides. I think after this, right? 
Yeah, just uh, two more verses to go. Okay, just so that the audience knows where we're ending here. After this lived Job in 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. Okay. And the Septuagint reads, And Job lived after his affliction 170 years, and all the years he lived were 240. Job saw his sons and his sons' sons, the fourth generation. Okay. Well, I mean, that that's that's a huge discrepancy, right? I mean, yes. we've, got, we've got 140 years and then this other one and all the years he lived were 240 years. It's a huge discrepancy. Yeah. So this would put, you know, if it's kind of not that surprising, though, because we see other people living extremely long lifespans in and around this time as well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Abraham lived 176 years. Uh, Jacob lived... 100 and how long 175 uh, he lived a long time too yeah I, I can't remember the exact age yeah. but yeah so they were living up there and there's no reason why yahweh couldn't give him such longevity um after going through the trials that he did right yeah um you know he got everything back he got his sons and his daughters back uh you know yeah, more wealth, more land, more, all of it, everything that he had before, and then some. <laughs> That's right. So it's, uh, plus years. Plus, years. yeah, and he got to keep living instead of like his wife just wanted to, for him to curse God and die. Yeah. All right. This is this is a very this is a very pertinent uh, slide here. Let's get to it. Job forty two seventeen. So Job died, being old and full of days. And the Septuagint reads, and Job died, an old man and full of days. And it is written that he will rise again with those whom the Lord raises up. This man is described in the Syriac book as living in the land of Osis, on the borders of the Idiome and Arabia, or excuse me, Arabia. And his name before was Jobab. And having taken an Arabian wife, he begot a son whose name was Enon. And he himself was the son of his father Zer, one of the sons of Esau. And his mother was Basora, so that he was the fifth from Abraham. Hmm. Okay. That's, I mean, that's a big chunk of text that we don't have in the Masoretic text there. Yes, that's an entire paragraph. It's It gives us uh, genealogy, placement of geography, as well as uh, a name change. His name, right, Jobab. So where have we seen Jobab before, Sean, in, in the canon of 66? I will pull it up. I'm pulling it up right now. Genesis 36, correct? It is, and I'm pulling it up on screen. Yeah. We should probably just read through a little bit of that because it uh, it talks it, about the who he descended from. Yeah, um, some of the other characters are in here too, right? Hey, Dad, son of Bay Dad. I mean, that's mm -hmm. it says these are the kings that reigned in the land of Edom before they reigned any king over the children of Israel, and Bela, the son of Beor, reigned in Edom, and the name of his city was Din Habab, and Bela died, and the Jobab, the son of Zerah, of Basra, reigned in his stead, and that's that's who we just read about, guys. Yeah, that's. This so Genesis actually calls him a king, yeah, which is important because we're about to read something from Jasher as well. So, this is where we have right here this is the father is the son of his father Zer, and this is exactly what Genesis uh, 32 uh, 33 says Bela died, and Jobab the son of Zerah of Basra reigned in his stead, and Jobab died, and the Husham of the land of Timani reigned in his stead. And it just goes down through a list of kings. Mm -hmm. And it, I mean, it, it names the the kings that uh, came and actually corresponded with them too. Yeah, we got Eliphaz there. These were all. I mean, they were all descendants. They were all somewhat related, right? These weren't just random kings that came up to Job. Right. These were these were these were family members essentially. Yeah, they were they were definitely a part of his interconnected tribes and clans that he dealt yeah. with in this region, and I think it's fascinating. And it even mentions this right here before. There were in there reigned any king over the children of Israel. Mm -hmm. So somebody just saying like these were kings of Edom before the Israelites anointed themselves before a king. Saul, yeah, before That's Saul right. came into power. Yeah. So there, there's our direct connection, guys. The big reveal of the book of Job that yeah. only the Septuagint lets you see, which is he he's literally mentioned in Job 36. Yeah, he's he's a descendant of Esau. Yeah. Right, not Jacob, Esau. Esau. And he's he's doing the Torah. He's a priest. That's he's, right. He's all these things. I mean, that that another reason why Judaism probably wants you not to understand that. 
That's right. You know, Esau's the big bad brother, right? Nothing good can descend from him, even though it was prophesied that things are going to come from him. Like, I mean, clearly they did. Good people. That's right. It's possible for people to repent. But if you preach an ideology, as we see preached in even in modern day Judaism, which is this idea that you're special if you're of this genealogy of Abraham. Like this is the same mindset that Yeshua is facing in John chapter eight with the Pharisees. Yeah. Like, cause they're like, oh, we're children of Abraham. You know, he's like, if you were, you'd be doing the deeds of Abraham, but instead you're children of Satan because you do his deeds. It's not about bloodline. It's about behavior. Yeah. So, you know, anyone can come to repentance mm -hmm. just because Esau was, you know, not the cool guy because he didn't serve the Lord and he, he turned away from the father. doesn't mean his descendants perpetually made the same decision. Right. So we see his descendants clearly in the in the canon that's already been approved by you know people that I don't give them authority to approve it. In that canon, they we have this entire book of Job telling us about a king of a descendant of Esau who was an extremely righteous man serving the Almighty with all of his heart and soul to the point where he's literally a priest of the Almighty. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, if you if you can't tell, guys, the people that. Just like just like Mormonism, just like uh, zero just like uh, Islam, just like um, uh, you know, pick a pick a religion, right? That has false beliefs that lead to destruction. The people in them, we pray for them, we love them. The religious leaders that propagate that false religion, we're critiquing their teachings. We still pray for their souls. Yeah. So okay. this system of Judaism, I'm not talking about the people, the Jewish people that follow it or are raised in it. I'm talking about the system of teaching, which is against scripture. We've just showed you an entire book that directly connects to Genesis, which goes fully against prominent teachings within Judaism. This is the same, this is the same mindset and, and bad heart that Peter was being reprimanded for in Acts chapter 10 with the vision of the animals coming down on the, on the blanket or whatever. Mm -hmm. So like it's trying to tell him like the father can make what is considered unclean clean. It, it's all about the repentance. And this is a, a prejudicial teaching within Judaism that has to be overcome. Um, yeah, exactly, man. So uh, I think I mean, we're putting emphasis on this, you guys, because um, there's people that do come out of mainstream church and, you know, they come to an understanding that the Torah, God's instructions for how we're supposed to be living day by day are still applicable. Right. The front of the book is still applicable to their lives currently and so in their zeal they look for more knowledge and information about that and unfortunately they end up going towards judaism because they assume based off of the, the false doctrines and teachings that they've heard regarding their authority that they are in an authoritative position to tell them you know what what they should be following right and so you go from one flawed religious uh you know sect into another one and it's just like it, we just we want to highlight that that's that's unfortunately the case in in many instances with people who come out of the church um and we just want to say we don't we don't ascribe any authority to judaism and as sean said there are good people there are people who just were raised in this just like we were all raised in whatever we were raised in right and and that doesn't that's we're not casting aspersions on them it's the actual system and, and the closed off individuals who are pompous and don't want anybody to look into the, the deeds of their fathers, their forefathers, and into the, you know, the religious um, environment and the way that they, they created this system, right? They don't want anyone to like blowing the lid off of it. So it's individuals like that, that we just want to warn people against. And we still should pray for those two, right? Always pray for your enemies. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I would even say like, make sure you know why they're, you think they're your enemy, you know, has that been taught to you as a kid or is it something you really, you know, have they really done anything against you? You know, it's, yeah. it's so sad. Um, but what's interesting is we just, we just revealed to folks that both Genesis and Job call Job a king. Yes, exactly. And we actually have another slide, don't we? There should be a part B to that. Is there oh, not? Right. There's more information because it's, Once, uh, it, it doesn't right. end there. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Wait, Sorry. there's more. There is more. There is more. I'm getting ahead of myself. Here we go. Um, it goes on to say, and there and these were the kings who reigned in Edom, which country he also ruled over. First Balak, the son of Beor, and the name of his city was Denaba. But after Balak, Jobab, who is called Job, and after him, Esom, who was the governor out of the country of Taman, and after him, Adad, the son of Barad, and who destroyed Medeam, in the plain of Moab, and in the name of his city was Gethame. And his friends who came to him were Eliphaz, the children of Esau, 
kings of the Tamanites, Baldad, sovereign of the Sakians, and so far, king of the Manaeans. All right. So there's just, it's just more mention of the progeny of Esau that yep. I wanted to highlight that, that they, they were all interconnected and kings. And yep. Um, yeah. So cool, man. So cool. Very cool. I, I wonder, Sean, uh, Balak, the son of Beor. I mean, I look, the name sounds reminiscent in this, in the book of Numbers, uh, Numbers 22. And, and when yes. Balak, son of Sephor, that's not the same person, but that we know that uh, Balaam is the son of Beor. I'm just wondering, is this right. this the general time? Like, are we in the same timeline somewhat here still or not? No, this should be. Uh, this, this is hundred years after, right? yeah, at least a hundred years before Numbers 24. Right. Okay. Yeah, but it's it's easy they would carry a lot of the same names, so it could it could be a descendant of Beor. Yeah. You could name like they'll name the next kid Bayor, and then his grandson will actually. Yes, this this will segue into as you mentioned earlier, Jasher, because yeah. Balaam, the son of Beor, is mentioned in the book of Jasher. Yeah, and he actually happens to be uh, contemporary with Job in the book of Jasher as well. That's why I bring that up, brother. Is, okay. is the, the timeline there has Balaam, son of Beor, along okay. with Job in the same kind of vicinity of time. So. And that's actually why you're bringing it up is because should I put this on the screen now? Yeah, I put her up because so just, I think I'll let her. you I'll let you take it away, brother. Yeah, in verse 15. So we're we're in the book of Jasher. This is chapter 66, starting verse 15. It says, and an officer, one of the king's counselors, so they're in Egypt right now. And this is the time of the uh Israel is down there, um, they're being enslaved essentially. Um and it says, and the nobles and the oh, princes. I'm sorry, one, one second. I, I tried to increase it, but it I lost my place. Oh, did you? <laughs> it even it even changed chapters too. Sorry. Oh, okay, that's okay. One second. Uh, what chapter was it 60, again? Sixty six. It should be. Man, it yeah, went all the way, way to forty seven. <laughs> sorry about that. No worries. 60, 67? 66. 66. Should be, yeah. And there it is. There it all is, right. yep. All right, it says, And an officer, one of the king's counselors, whose name was Job, from Mesopotamia in the land of Uz, answered the king, saying, So this is, we're assuming this is the same Job that we just have been talking about this last hour and 20 minutes. Right. From Mesopotamia, saying, if it please the king, and this is the Egyptian king, let him hear the counsel of his servant. And the king said unto him, Speak. And Job spoke before the king, the princes, and before all the elders of Egypt, saying, Behold, the counsel of the king, which he advised formerly, respecting the labor of the children of Israel, is very good. You must not remove from them that labor forever. But this is the advice counseled by which you may lessen them, if it seems good to the king to afflict them. Behold, we have feared war for a long time and we said when israel becomes fruitful in the land they will drive us from the land if a war should take place if it pleases the king let a royal decree go forth and let it be written in the laws of egypt which shall not be revoked that every male child born to the israelites his blood shall be spilled upon the ground okay and by your doing this when all the male children of israel shall have died the evil of their wars will cease let the king do so and send for all the hebrew midwives and order them in this matter to execute it so that the thing please the king and the princes and the king did according to the word of Job. So here we have, according to the book of Jasher, this modern version that we have, it, it paints Job in a negative light. He's an adversary. He's he's not doing things righteous. He's essentially, he's actually, he's not even a king in this. He's, a, he's an advisor of the king of Egypt here. And he's telling them, continue the forced labor do all this this negative stuff towards the children of israel because if we don't then they're going to continue to multiply and and you know mm -hmm. if war ever comes they're gonna they're gonna have the you know the power to overtake us and right. so we got job doing all these things that are contrary to the character that we know of job in the book of job that's right yeah he literally trying to jasher trying to claim that job was the guy who came up with the idea to kill the hebrews in exodus chapter one yeah that it wasn't even it wasn't even Pharaoh's idea, but it was Job's idea to counsel him to do this, and I just I cannot disagree with that more, because that's the book of Job shows Job as a king from Edom, and he's a righteous man who follows the law of God to the point where he's literally venerated by the Father as a righteous man, and I do not like none of this makes any sense. This is the biggest one of the biggest contradictions 
that Ken and I have probably found in the book of Jasher. Yeah. And Cause it's not just that- a detail. It's not just like, Oh, he got the, the age wrong or, you know, it's, it's a huge theological idea. Yeah. And slander of the character of Job that we, that we have other writings that venerate Job's character. Yeah. And we, we actually see another instance of Job popping up, um, you know, when Moses is just a young lad. Right. Yeah. Um, and we don't have to read that now, but um, still painting him in a negative light. And this is, I think this is one of the reasons why Sean and I are somewhat hesitant to get into this book of Jasher, because although it is mentioned by name in the canon of 66, there, there's just blatant contradictions in it, such as the one, you know, we're speaking of Job tonight and, you know, I figured we should bring this one up because it's we can do the book of Jasher, um, but we're likely just going to have to highlight some of the the blatant contradictions. That's going to be ha- another episode like we did with the book of Adam and Eve and uh, the Ascension of Isaiah, the Testament of Solomon. Um, that's likely where we're going to have to go, unfortunately, with with the current version of the book of Jasher that we have today, at least. Yeah. And, it, and of course, Ken, this is what we see a lot when it comes to the book of Jasher, which is people will say there's a lot of there's a lot of things in Jasher that don't line up, but I've seen people will do their best to defend it. Right. So uh, all, all due respect, J.R. Cleave, you're claiming there's two people with the same name from what we just read from Jasher 66. But the text doesn't tell us that the text just tells us it's a guy named Job from the land of Uz, which is exactly what Job tells us. So if there are two people, the text doesn't delineate that there are two. Yeah. So that, that would leave people in mass confusion to the character of Job, who is, I mean, there's literally an entire book about him. And he's mentioned in Genesis as a, as a king. So I just think it's interesting um, to see that type of completely contradictory story out of the book of Jasher. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. But, um, okay, so Sean... After reviewing the Masoretic text against the Septuagint version of Job, mm-hmm. I think we've concluded that the Septuagint version is superior um, because it, it gives us a lot of these tidbits that mm-hmm. are missing out of the Masoretic text. But also, interestingly enough, as we read off screen, uh, one of the last slides there, it talks about him being written in the Syriac book, mm-hmm. right? What is this referring to? Yeah, there's an additional testament of Job. Right. That was originally transcribed in Syriac. Exactly. So we're thinking we're gonna, you know, this is honor of kings. We we wanna we wanna bring forth these texts. And this so happens that the Septuagint gives us a little a little gem, a, a little lead, if it were. That's um, right. Give us a breadcrumb. Exactly. Into another potential, you know, extra biblical text that we can, we can look at it. It's not too long. And I think that's actually what we're going to end up doing for, for our next episode here at honor of Kings is look into this Testament of Job. Is it good? What does it contain? Is it, is it going to, you know, venerate this, uh, this book of Job that we just read? Is it going to contradict stick around to find out? We're going to, we're going to definitely cover that. Yes. It's going to be fun, fun guys. Cause I, one thing I just want to point out before we move on, I know we, we just talked about a lot of stuff, but, I, this is something amazing that uh, let me pull this back up real quick. This is something amazing that we don't see a lot of uh, talk about in the rest of Job. Look at the very first, very first few things here in, in 42, 17, it says it is written that he will rise again with those whom the Lord raises up. Mm-hmm. So this is someone that is like, they're just declaring, they know he's going to be resurrected. Yeah. That is amazing. And guys, we're going to see something like that in the Testament of Job when we review it in, exactly. in following episodes. So just keep that in mind, because again, this is in the canon. The canon actually validates the book of Genesis, which I don't, that's the kind of a point we didn't really bring up Ken, but like, yeah, we don't, we don't even know what Genesis 36, who that Job Ab was, unless we had the Septuagint version of Job exactly. to realize that Genesis is being validated by the Septuagint version of, of Job. Yeah. yeah. It's fascinating. Exactly. Fascinating. So Very much so. What's up, brother? We we've come to the end of the broadcast. Um, it's been a it's been a power packed one. I'm sorry, guys. I don't think we have time for questions today, but um, hopefully it's been edifying to everybody. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, I, I think it it's been edifying to me at least. I know that. Yeah. Um, it's just it's fun to sleuth through these things and and find little tidbits of, of fascinating information that just kind of to me it, it builds faith. 
It really does. When we continue to see consistency in the message all throughout, right? Yahweh, all of a sudden to me is he, he's making more sense. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he has one law for all of humanity. He, uh, you know, his, his priesthood is something that was super essential for, for men to, to have established as part of the law. Job was a priest. I mean, there's so many things as we talked about. And, and to me, it's just, I'm thankful that we have these versions and these faithful men that have, um, translated these versions for our, our edification and our ability to, to study. Right. So that's right. I've been edified. Hopefully that you brothers and sisters watching enjoyed our, our two part series on this. And I know you're going to get a lot out of the Testament of Job. It's a very fascinating little read. Once again, I'm going to provide quite a bit of information regarding Job's circumstances, even before he was plagued by Satan, essentially. Right. Yeah. So, um, stick around absolutely stick around if you don't mind hitting the like button on this uh this video and subscribe to the channel uh for those who aren't subscribed just you know all you have to do is click a button all you have to do <laughs> if you're already here watching you, you might as well hit the subscribe button it, it it helps me out it'll help you out especially if you hit the notifications little bell button as well because you know, you're gonna find out when our next video is gonna be released so just go ahead and do yourself a favor and do that also go over to Sean's channel, Kingdom in Context, and subscribe to him there. Um, brother, anything else you want to say? That's it, man. I think we had a we had a power-packed episode. I'm, I'm looking forward to following episodes. Awesome. All right, you guys. You guys take care and continue studying in the Word, and we will see you next week. See you guys later. Shalom.